Good afternoon, and welcome to the Interdisciplinary Humanities Center. My name is Susan Derwin, and I'm the director of the IHC. Uh, as the public face of humanities for the campus, the center runs programs that draw upon the expertise, practices, and skills associated with the humanities to support scholars in the production of new knowledge and to empower community members as agents of social change. Our guest today, Professor Wendy Chun, was originally scheduled to speak at the IHC last year in our public event series, too much information. We did have to reschedule her talk, and I am very happy that all of you are here today as we continue to consider the diverse impacts and the implications of living in the information age. I would like to acknowledge the Chumash people who are the traditional custodians of the land upon which the Interdisciplinary Humanities Center is located, and I would also like to pay respect to elders, both past and present, as well as other indigenous people present. And I am delighted to welcome Wendy Chun, who is Simon Fraser University's Canada 150 Research Chair in New Media and Professor in the School of Communication. Professor Chun also directs the Digital Democracies Institute, which integrates research in the humanities and data sciences to address questions of equality and social justice. Before coming to Simon Fraser, Wendy Chun was professor and chair of the Department of Modern Culture and Media at Brown University, where she worked for almost two decades. At the Digital Democracies Institute, she leads the Mellon-funded Data Fluencies Project, an interdisciplinary endeavor that draws upon her expertise in systems design engineering and English literature. She has written many books, including Discriminating Data, Correlation, Neighborhoods, and the New Politics of Recognition, Updating to Remain the Same, Habitual New Media, Programmed Visions, Software and Memory, and Control and Freedom, Power and Paranoia in the Age of Fiber optic Optics. Her most recent collection of essays appeared this year in French and is a study of the biases that govern our interactions on online platforms. Professor Chun is a fellow of the Royal Society of Canada and has also held fellowships from the Guggen Guggenheim, ACLS, the American Academy of Berlin, and the Radcliffe Institute for Advanced Study at Harvard. Her talk today is co-sponsored by the Sarah Miller McCune and George D. McCune Endowment and is entitled, How Are You? Sentiment, Surveillance, and Anti-Asian Racism. Welcome, Wendy. Hello, everyone. Thank you all for coming, and thank you, Susan, for the lovely introduction. It's really wonderful to be back here in Santa Barbara and to see so many familiar faces. Um, so my talk today um, draws from, I'm just going to, I realize I'm going to overshoot very quickly. Um, so my talk today both draws from and is inspired by work that I'm currently doing with Kelly Dobson and Karina Albrecht on data visceralization. Um, in an article that Grace Hong, Lisa Nakamura, and I have written in response to the alarming uh, rise of explicit anti-Asian racism during the pandemic, um, from mass killings such as the Atlanta shootings um, to the 700% increase in anti-Asian hate crimes in cities like Vancouver, which is where I currently live. Um, and this article will be coming out next year from Critical Inquiry. But before I get there, I want to start with a seemingly banal question. How are you? How are you? Have you ever paused and wondered how weird it is that we start conversations by asking people, how are you, when we usually don't expect or want an answer? Um, so the weirdness of this greeting really hit me when I lived in Germany. Um, and in Germany, I found these three little words, how are you, which were supposed to make conversation easy and light, did the opposite. Right? Um, so strangers were baffled and annoyed. Um, the person at the checkout counter thought I was crazy or American, which as far as I can tell in Germany are the same things. Um, and then 
friends and colleagues, instead of saying, fine, how are you, would launch into a 15-minute conversation about their digestion, their marital status. It was way too much information. And by the end, both they and I really regretted that I ever asked them how they were. Um, now, how are you is often translated as vegets. Um, and here you see how vegets is explained to Americans, right? We're warned to be careful with vegets. You can't just say vegets back. Doing so is confusing at best and rude at worst. Um, nonetheless, this site encourages us to discover discomfort and give it a try, wishes us good luck. Right? Now, although similar, vegets isn't how are you, right? So VGETS asks for an objective um, response. It goes or it doesn't, or yes or no. But how are you is all about you, about your subjective feelings, your sentiments, your subjective state. Um, at the same time though, because we don't expect or want an answer, um, how are you as a greeting presumes disaffection. It presumes disinterest and alienation. So how are you, as a rhetorical question, fine, how are you, presumes that what you say and how you feel don't coincide. So it creates a certain two-dimensionality, a distance between what's outside and inside, between what's manifest and latent. Um, more cynically, it makes it so you have something to hide, how you really feel, even as people are prying. So that breaking this conventional disaffection shows that you're real or authentic, right? So actually confessing how you feel somehow shows your authenticity. Now this is really strange, um, but strangely ordinary. Because, and this is what I want to consider today, that this drive to know and not know how you are grounds subjectivity on social media today. So users, um, social media organizes and creates users not by screaming, hey you, but through a creepy and constant, how are you? Right? Um, a space of both disaffection and surveillance, a space haunted by histories of occupation and capture, a space structured to pursue and to foster an ever-elusive authenticity. Okay, so what do I mean by this? Well, let's unpack this by turning to bossware. Okay. So during the pandemic, many of us started working, teaching, and studying remotely. Right? And what began as an exception has become um, a new North American norm in certain industries. Um, according to Forbes magazine, uh, remote work has become a permanent feature. And not because it's claimed businesses can save a lot of money by no longer having to pay for infrastructure, um, but because working from home makes employees happier. It's better for their mental health. Right? At least according to um, a poll by Owl Labs, right? And Owl Labs produces supposedly lovable 360 um, camera, mic, and speaker devices um, so that people who aren't there feel like they're part of the room. How many of you used an Owl, right? Yeah, so we have one at the Institute, and what I love about it is that the resolution is so low, everybody looks good, right? Um, remote work is the future of work because happier employees, it's argued, are more productive. So according to a work from home consulting firm, employees that work from home are 20% more productive and nearly twice as likely to work beyond 40 hours a week, right? Which is why work from home takes a machete to the work life problem, right? More work, more life. But as you see here, work from home also provokes a lot of anxiety. Um, pessimistic managers picture their employees watching Netflix in bed all day. Um, so increasingly, corporations that are embracing work from home are also embracing bossware. So computing monitoring system, a software that constantly watches you. Um, and according to The Guardian, um, bossware is coming for almost every worker. Right? Um, of course, 
anyone in the university shouldn't be surprised by this because universities have put Bossware on university computers for a very long time. Um, so according to urban lore, professors at Stanford were told never to type in anything that they didn't want advertised because there was, there was um, keystroke logging software um, on their computers. But Bossware isn't just about what you're doing. It's not just about logging keystrokes, taking screenshots, recording mouse movements, activating webcams and microphones, and periodically taking pictures of you. Um, it's not just about surveillance. It's also about prediction. It's about what you could do. Um, and what Bossware does is it reads in everything you write and then uses sentiment analysis to determine your risk level. Um, and you're flagged as a potential risk when your sentiment score shows that you're disgruntled, or more importantly, when your sentiment score changes radically. Um, OK. But how do they know this? Um, what's sentiment analysis? Um, so sentiment analysis is a task of natural language processing that extracts sentiments and opinions from texts. So it's a form of emotion recognition, which along with affective computing, um, until a few years ago, or, or at least a decade ago, really drove the development of artificial intelligence. Um, now sentiment analysis is considered a mature technology, which is really remarkable given, and this is something I'll unpack for you a little bit, how incredibly error prone it is. It has never worked properly. Right? So most simply, sentiment analysis determines whether a given text expresses a positive or negative sentiment, where sentiment is the expression of subjectivity as either a positive or negative opinion. Uh, so sentiment analysis is all about subjectivity. And it entails three steps. Okay, so the first step is to determine whether the text is subjective, right? So sentiment analysis is not about things that are factual or true or false. They relate to a person's environment and their context. Um, number two is once you've determined it's, it's subjective is to figure out the text's polarity. Is it positive or negative? Step number three is to determine how intensely positive or negative it is. Um, for example, sentiment analysis takes a tweet like this and determines, A, is it an opinion? On Twitter, it's safe to assume that everything is an opinion. Um, so in many ways, Twitter was made for sentiment analysis, and sentiment analysis was made for Twitter. Um, and next, it determines whether it's positive or negative. And here you see tweets by another Wendy Chun. This is not me. Um, <laughs> testing sentiment analysis on the web, right? So I do have a doppelganger that actually does this for a living, right? Um, OK, so how does it do this? Um, well, in two, until recently, there were two main approaches to automatic sentiment analysis. One was lexicon-based, so one that's based on dictionaries and rules, and the second um, was based on machine learning models. So it was trained on large data sets and used humanly and statistically determined features, such as word frequency, parts of speech, opinions or phrases, and negation. Um, and most actually combine the two. Um, lexicon based ones look for certain words which they score as positive or negative. So good, excellent, masterpiece, all good. Um, bad, terrible, disaster, strongly negative. Um, as well as descriptors which further determine the intensity of polarity. So adjectives here um, will play a big role in um, factoring and intensity. So, Machine learning systems also use emojis, and that was the latest thing before they used large language models to determine a text sentiment. So rather than asking humans to label uh, data sets to see if a text was positive or negative, they used emojis as labels. So whenever you were using an emoji, you were doing the work of people doing sentiment analysis, right? So if anything had an emoji in it, it was clearly subjective. Um, the emoji was either positive or negative, so therefore trained everything before the text is either positive or negative, right? Um, and then the idea was to train a neural net using this data to produce a model that can take in any text um, and score its sentiment. But as I said, more recently, sentiment analysis is being done by prompting large language models. Right? And here you see 
um, how it's being sold, um, precisely in terms of figuring out sentiment of markets. Right? Now, fundamentally, sentiment analysis is about prediction. It's about predicting future sentiments based on past values. Um, so the basic task in sentiment analysis is to have enough information so that when a new item, a new tweet, sentence, headline, excerpt, or whole text emerges, um, the characteristics can be extracted in order to decide whether it contains positive or negative sentiment on the base of existing information, right? So it's based on existing information or ground, ground truth, right? And this ground truth for sentiment analysis systems, and this is why large language models can do sentiment analysis so well, is that the ground truth are, is the same. It's basically everything on the internet. Right? Um, and so sentiment analysis systems like large language models treat the internet as a universal and crucial source of information, um, a source for automatically monitoring the public opinion and assisting in decision making. So Twitter posts have been used to determine to think um, how an election will go. Um, you also have sentiment analysis used to detect bias in news sources. But basically the ground truth of these systems is an angry tweeter. But the goal of sentiment analysis isn't just prediction. It's behavioral change. Right? So corporations use sentiment analysis to see how best to manage user complaints and to change and organize user behavior more generally. Um, so recall the outrage in 2012 when Facebook used sentiment analysis to study and affect people's feeds, right? So this was a study that showed if you put negative words, people's feeds turn negative. If you put positive words, people's feeds turn positive, right? Um, they apologized, right? But this apology and outrage completely misses the point. Um, which is that this behavioral change, as Jerome Lanier pointed out, is the product, right? So as Lanier points out in The Social Dilemma, um, it's too simple to say the user is the product. Um, what the product is, is the gradual, slight, and imperceptible change in your own behavior and perception. Right? And he argues that this is the only thing that they can make money off of. It's small and it's slight, but it's vast, um, worth a lot of money. Creepy. Um, and perhaps most creepy when it's applied to workers. Because the point of bossware is to change worker behavior. It's to shock them by letting them know they're being watched. Um, and this seems especially creepy and wrong because, as I mentioned earlier, sentiment analysis is extremely error prone. So Pippa Adams, who's a postdoc in the DDI, wrote a dissertation showing how sentiment analysis errs by scoring misogynistic comments as positive and feminist comments as negative. Um, so to give you one example, Proud Boys, anything with Proud Boys in it is going to be deemed to be positive because proud is so, uh, is seemed to be so positive, right, as a, as a word. Okay, but we have to realize that sentiment analysis and its limitations aren't new, right? It's always been failing, it's always been error prone, and it's always been about monitoring workers and making them more productive. Bossware isn't the beginning, sorry, Bossware isn't the end of the story, it's actually part of the beginning. And sentiment analysis has always been good enough to justify surveillance and bad enough to justify even more surveillance. Right. Um, but sentiment analysis, however, hasn't simply been about surveillance. But, and this is key, it's about making this state of constant surveillance feel like freedom. So making the state of constant surveillance feel like freedom by managing and indeed producing hostility, um, disaffection and cooperation, where cooperation means cooperation with management, right, by constantly asking, how are you? Right. Which brings me to part two, illuminating cooperation. So why do we even care about, oh, this is um, I'm a little too close to it. 
I'll, I'll give you some distance, okay. Um, so why do we even care about sentiment? Where does sentiment analysis come from? Well, we think sentiment matters to work, in particular the management of work, because of a series of highly influential and controversial experiments that took place at the Hawthorne Western Electric Factory, which is just outside of Chicago in Cicero, um, from 1927 to 1932. Right? So this is a a century-long history. Um, these experiments were a collaboration between Western Electric and the Harvard Business School. So this was one of the first Harvest Biz Harvard Business School case studies. Um, and it's been considered to be key to understanding human relations as well as the work-life balance. Um, the most ex famous experiment began when executives in the company segregated five factory workers, five women workers who were working on relays for special study. Um, and they wanted to know the relationship between things like fatigue um, and monotony, uh, monotony, monot, monot, I can't, I've been traveling too much, you know what I'm trying to say. Um, and variables such as temperature, humidity, hours of sleep, work breaks, um, free lunches, and reduced hours. Um, but to do so with precision, uh, they placed these women in a special test room in which everything was controlled and measured. Um, so these women were under constant surveillance. Um, and they underwent medical of exams every six weeks, um, which they really hated, right? They recorded what they ate, how many hours they slept, what their responsibilities were at home. They even told researchers what they would wish for if they were given one wish. Um, and their conversations were recorded because there weren't just five women in the room, right? There was a sixth woman um, who was a layout operator who supported their work, and they didn't count her work because it couldn't be counted in the same way the number of relays could. And there was also a test room observer. And the initial test room observer was an engineer who had played a key role in making the experiment possible. And his job was, one, to keep accurate records of everything uh, that happened, and two, to create and maintain a friendly atmosphere um, in the test room, so in other words, to ensure cooperation. And everything was measured against how many relays these women produced when they were working genuinely and authentically as they felt. So they kept telling them, work authentically. Right? Now this little experiment lasted for five years. Um, and it was eventually amended to include interviews of 20,000 employees. Um, because what happened was both expected and unexpected. So at a certain level, um, these experiments were a complete failure. So what they did was they gave these women lunch breaks. They gave them shorter hours and productivity went up. Right? So far, so good. But then the executives were like, let's take all the benefits away and see what happens. So they took everything away, but productivity was still high. So something else mattered. Right? So what was this something else? Um, well, the experiment fundamentally and accidentally changed how these women were paid. Um, so these women usually worked in groups of hundreds. Um, and instead, they were in a group of five, and so um, their wage depended on what the smaller group made. Um, but the experimenters thought it had to be more than money, right? This was Harvard Business School. This couldn't just be as simple as giving people more money, right? Um, so they selected another five women, and only changed the pay structure, and they found that productivity went up, but not as much. Then they took a group of men aside, linemen, and they you know, gave them all the perks, you know, free lunches, shorter working days, et cetera, et cetera, and nothing changed. Nothing ever changed, right? Um, because in the test room, these men were, of course, deeply suspicious. Um, and they made sure that their output was always the same, right? So what was responsible for the difference? Well, according to researchers, their great realization was worker sentiment, 
that the behavior of workers couldn't be understood apart from their feelings or sentiments. So that in the work situation, the meaning of a change is likely to be as important, or if not more so, than the change itself. And that the meanings that people ascribe to their um, situation stemmed from their sentiments. Um, and intriguingly, it was the women themselves who provided this answer. So in response to the question, what do you think has made it possible for you to increase your earnings since you've been on the test, they stated greater freedom, the absence of bosses, more personal attention, the opportunity to set one's own pace and to earn what one makes without being held by a large group. These women, in other words, were having fun, right? And here you see the recorded banter. Um, and having fun was the interpretation of the researchers, right? Now, if these women were having fun, they were having fun, as the researchers pointed out, um, in the oddest of circumstances. So these women, as T.N. Whitehead, so T.N. Whitehead, yes, son of the Whitehead, um, was one of the researchers here. Um, pointed out these women were far more thoroughly supervised than they had ever been in the regular department. They were watched by an observer of their own. Professors from MIT and Harvard used to come and visit. Um, and management would visit all the time as well. But the researchers argued what was key was that the character and the purpose of the supervision was different and felt to be so. So these women knew that they were taking part in an important experiment, and they were consulted about every change. So in other words, one fundamental difference, and this is what they said, this is what I want to push us towards, is that these women were aware of the fact that they always had an audience. Right? So again, this experiment has become foundational to research in so-called work-life balance and human relations. So it showed that management needed to constantly interview and consult with workers in order to tap into their stores of latent energy, to take what was a latent potential and make it manifest, um, and produce productive cooperation where cooperation was not unionization. So the backdrop of this was actually drives for unionization um, but cooperation meant cooperation with management, and rewarding did not equal better pay. Right? It's also become famous for what was called in the 1950s the Hawthorne effect, um, so that the idea that subjects change their performance on a test in response to being observed. Okay, so this was decades before Foucault's discipline and punish. Right? Now, According to the researchers, uh, these women, because they were observed, committed to doing the impossible. They were committed to always producing more irregardless of their circumstances. Right? So that was their interpretation. Maybe. But this miraculous response almost didn't happen. Right? So this miracle was only possible because, as Melissa Gregg and others have emphasized, the company actually kicked out two of the initial workers. Um, and they kicked them out because they were truly working as they felt. Um, so for the experiment to work, executives had to recruit seemingly cooperative and genuine workers who could be trusted to work as they felt. Um, but working as they felt was actually the last thing that the experimenters wanted. Um, so when operators 1A and 2A's productivity didn't improve after they were given um, free lunches and breaks, they were threatened. Um, they were told, if your productivity doesn't go up, you're going to be kicked out. And then as good researchers, they then measured the impact that this threat had on their behavior, which was nothing. Um, and so they were kicked out, but they were arguably like the two male line, like the male linemen workers, actually working as they felt. Right? They were working at a steady pace in order to keep everyone in line. But they were kicked out, as you can see here, um, not only because their productivity didn't improve, but also because they spoke to each other in Polish. Um, about the other workers. Um, so they ridiculed uh, operators three and four for working like a fool. Um, and four out of the five original workers were Polish Americans. 
Um, the fifth was Norwegian, and her productivity just never changed, very steady. Um, and these experiments were very much experiments of white Americanization, because Cicero was a, was a sundown town. So things really started cooking, and the Hawthorne effect emerged when they replaced Operator 2A with an Italian-American who basically took over and pushed everybody to work harder. Right? Um, she was the most educated out of the group, the most ambitious, and the main breadwinner of her family. So sh shortly after the experiment um, started, her mother died. Um, and so she was responsible for maintaining the home, um, her father and her brother, in all senses of the word. She was the male, main breadwinner and also the person taking care of the household. So as she put it, she needed the money. Right? Now there's a ton more to say about this experiment, and I'm happy to talk more about this during Q&A, because what's interesting with all those 20,000 interviews they did, it was, it was basically sentiment analysis. They were positive, negative, and all the problems we know now about sentiment analysis, they identified then. But I want to stop here um, to sketch how sentiment analysis moved from governing workers to governing occupied peoples and territories under stress, which brings me to part three, interning aliens. Um, so during World War II, uh, the US interned all Japanese nationals and Japanese Americans living on the West Coast. Right? Um, notably, they didn't do the same for Germans or Italians. Um, and the decision to intern these people, irregardless of their citizenship, was explicitly and unapologetically racist, um, linked to both a belief in oriental inscrutability um, and in the biological loyalties of the Japanese. So General John DeWitt, who oversaw the US internment, argued that they had to intern all Japanese because there's no way to determine their loyalty. It makes no difference whether he's an American citizen, he's still a Japanese, you needn't worry about Italians at all except in certain cases, also at the same time for Germans except in individual cases. But we must worry about the Japanese all the time until he's wiped off the map. Or more succinctly, uh, at a press conference, he said, a Jap's a Jap. There's no way to discern between them and no need. And as you'll see here, no evidence can exonerate them because the fact that nothing happened became evidence that something would happen. Right? Now, General DeWitt's openly racist attitude was countered um, and it wasn't the only one, and it was countered, and this is what I want to emphasize in this section, by applied social scientists. And applied social scientists um, resisted this overtly racist, which they argued was actually costly and ineffective view, through sentiment analysis. Sentiment analysis, which they argued allowed them to pose as surrogate friends of, the, of loyal Japanese Americans. Right. And thus to understand Japanese and Japanese Americans and overcome oriental inscrutability. Right. And therefore to discern individual and cultural sentiments and thus to manage and govern these and indeed future interned peoples through this post-racist racism. Um, and to make this point, I'm going to focus on the Bureau of Sociological Research, which was run by the psychiatrist Alexander Layton um, in Poston. So Poston was the largest internment camp in the United States. And like many others, it was built, really poorly built, um, on what would, were then called Indian reservations. So this one was in Colorado. There were many, of course, in the interior of California. Um, these camps were supposed to be to some extent, self-governed, right? And what was unique about Poston was that it was actually run by both the Office of Indian Affairs and the War Relocation Authority. Um, and so in these camps, Japanese Americans were encouraged to work, um, to become independent and therefore gain self-respect, to prove their future usefulness as members of the American nation. Um, but these camps were not supposed to be like German concentration camps. 
Indeed, through their work, Japanese and Japanese Americans were supposed to show that the United States could carry out a program of evacuation and relocation in a democratic manner that would provide the greatest possible contrast to population shifts in Axis countries. But the importance of these camps goes beyond good PR for the US during World War II. Because according to Leighton, understanding the camps was crucial to how the US was going to govern post-World War II when it was looking at its occupied territories. So in particular, the camps would be key to understanding and dealing with disintegrating communities, in particular administrative problems in countries where the people are very different from the average American in racial descent, traditional values, and predominant attitudes. Right? This was all about relief and rehabilitation. Um, and these camps, like... Uh, reservations were so important because they were supposed to be spaces of exceptional democracy. Um, so the goal of these camps, as Brian Hayashi pointed out, was to democratize the enemy by literally, as Jody Bird has argued, transiting through the Indian. Um, and these camps also, and relatedly, were also sites of sociological study. Um, so it's because the Office of Indian Affairs was in charge that Leighton was hired. Um, so Collier, who was then the director of the OIA, hired him because he had worked previously on Navajo and Inuit communities. Um, and according to Leighton, Collier viewed Poston as an as an experiment in colonial administration. So this comes from Leighton's sociological journal. You have to imagine Collier, the director of the OIA, addressing evacuees in Camp 2 of Poston and telling them that it was respons their responsibility, the responsibility of the evacuees and the administration to make Poston a success, to make their internment camp a model of not what democracy was in America, but what democracy could be in America. Um, and so as Leighton noted in his journal, um, the reception was, was mixed at best. Um, and he thought the evacuees more resented uh, the government for treating them as guinea pigs um, in a vast sociological experiment. Right? Now, Leighton's goals were to aid the administration by analyzing the attitudes of evacuees with particular reference to the responses to administrative acts and to draw practical conclusions as to what worked well and what didn't work so well and why, to gather data of a general character that might be used in the administration of dislocated communities. And because things didn't work out so well, right? so the Bureau of Sociological Research sounded to a lot of people like the Federal Bureau of Investigation. Right? Given this, they had to then train, um, train uh, workers of Japanese ancestry in social um, analysis so they could be helpful in occupied areas of the Pacific during or after the war. And so to do this work, they used a five-pronged approach which foreshadows almost every technique that social media companies are using today. Right. So the first was general observation. Um, spread about the community in as many strategic spots as possible, the research staff observed and recorded what people were saying in conversations around the rooms, Siri, um, in uh, mess halls, in shower rooms, in the, at the doorsteps in the evening, and similar places. In each observation, it was considered desirable to note the following points. What were the sentiments expressed by word and action? What were the circumstances under which these occurred? What were the emotional tones and implications of the pers principal persons? What kinds of people were involved? What happened as a result? Right. And they went through the daily paper and everything that was published doing this kind of sentiment analysis. As well as this, they engaged in intensive interviews. So this was very much like the second part of the Hawthorne experiment. Collection of records. Um, so this step... Um, 
consisted of collecting from every available source data of social significance. Four were public opinion polls. So this was just the beginning of Gallup. Um, and they used opinion polls amongst evacuees on a weekly basis, um, as well as personality studies. So well before Cambridge Analytica, um, the idea that w what we needed were personality profiles. Um, the team then produced weekly sentiment charts um, about things like uh, food, et cetera. Um, now, although Poston was the first internment camp to have a sociological research center, um, these social science divisions soon became an important part of every camp. Um, and tellingly, Secretary John McCloy actually objected to the early release of Japanese Americans from the camps to serve as farm workers or to serve in the military because doing so would entail missing a big opportunity to study the Japanese, to find out what they're thinking about and how we might very well influence their thinking in right directions before they're again distributed to the communities. Um, McCloy lost, and Japanese Americans did become farm workers and part of the military. Um, now, these applied social science projects became so important because the camps failed. Um, because the folks in these camps didn't become model communities filled with model minorities um, as the OIA and WRA envisioned. So Japanese Americans only became model minorities after they passed through these camps, right? And Japanese Americans were the first ones called model minorities, right? So in these camps, um, what happened were that people became disaffected and rebelled, right? So in, if in the wild, when there were amongst the communities, there was no protests, um, in the camps, there were general strikes and discontent. Um, and this was uh, because not only were the camps poorly built, so Postin 1, 2, and 3 was, were called Roastin, Toastin, and Dustin, right? These were really poorly built. Um, the wages offered to the internees were extremely low, and half the time they weren't paid. Um, because as Leighton noted, half the administrators thought that Poston should be a concentration camp. Um, and things broke down in November 1942 with a general strike in Poston 1. And this general strike was supported by many who had previously sided with the administration, so the Nisei that had previously sided with the administration. And the Bureau of Sociological Research credited itself uh, with turning this crisis into opportunity. So working against the more overtly racist um, administrators who wanted to use the military, um, the heads of research basically gave it as their opinion that if they, um, they would come out of the situation with much better influence in the community than it had previously wielded if it negotiated carefully. Um, so the administration followed their advice, and within weeks, um, there was more cooperation between the people and the governing body than ever before. Right? And the Bureau of Sociological Research was so successful, they argued, because they used sentiment analysis to shape the future. Um, and sentiment, as you see here, um, and these are Leighton's diagrams to explain what they were doing, um, sentiment was so key, as this diagram shows, um, because it determined the success of any response to change. So sentiment, which he argued was analogous to the conditional reflexes studied extensively in lower animals, basically non-humans, was key to successful social engineering under conditions of captivity and stress. And Leighton's success and influence went beyond the camp. So because he was able to say, look, we turned this general strike um, into a great opportunity where finally we have democratic engagement and self-governing by these evacuees, he became chief of the foreign morale analysis division for the Office of War Information. So he was charged with mapping attitudes about surrender through the Japanese press as well as diaries um, of 
prisoners of war. He also visited Japan uh, post Hiroshima, um, and he was uh, the research leader of the team sent by the US Strategic Bombing Survey um, to study the feelings and responses of survivors. Right? So what, all this, so what this means is that women operators and Japanese-American internees lie at the heart of sentiment analysis. So they're central to current forms of social media analysis, manipulation and research, projections and mappings of social media subjectivities, as well as the creepy friendships that exploit those whom they befriend and supposedly protect. And Leighton very much viewed himself as a sort of surrogate friend, right? So at, at the heart of this lie disaffected people who are deliberately disrupted, their communities deliberately disrupted and reorganized, and constantly asked, how are you? Right. If this is so, what's absolutely key, and this is what I want to end with, is that we realize that what's read as authentic and genuine and sentiment is anything but. So the Italian-American operator was an operator, right? So she and her colleagues knew uh, that their work and responses affected everyone. So they were considered minor celebrities within the factory. And they knew that if they, their productivity went up in response to lunch breaks, everybody else would get a lunch break. Again, what's key, no matter how literal sentiment might try to be or sentiment analysis might treat sentiment to be, it, like how are you, asking somebody how they are, always invokes a gap between what's manifest and latent, between what's outside and inside, even as it seeks to overcome this gap. Right? This gap which it produces never disappears. So what sentiment analysis reveals is anything but the conditional reflexes um, studied ex extensively in lower animals. Or if it does, it reveals how complicated lower animals are. And I don't know how many of you have experimented with rats, ra rabbits. No one's going to confess. Um, if you actually read the early journals of that, they, they, the mice have personalities. Um, it's, it's really interesting to see why now we, we view this completely as flat, given when this was starting, there was the large write-ups about the personality of rat number one versus rat number two, right? Um, but Leighton's, um, and what we also need to um, realize is that Leighton's history of the camp and the Bureau of uh, Sociological Research um, was also challenged by evacuees. Right. And I want to end with a passage from uh, Richard Nishimoto, who is a subject of a personality study in one of, uh, of um, Leighton's disaffected researchers. So he left the project because he disliked Leighton and then joined the one that was run by Berkeley. So there were three different sociological research um, projects happening at Poston. Um, so in Nishimoto's personality study slash autobiography, he starts by mocking Leighton's perhaps lurid interest in his subjects. Well, doctor, don't you think we better go in now? The overture of the second act has begun, you know. Oh, yes, I know that you've been studying the personality traits of the lady standing over there. But don't you think you've been looking at her long enough? You've been glaring at her for the last 15 minutes, you know. Yes, yes, she's beautiful, glamorous, and all that. But I think that the leading character of the drama is more interesting. So Nishimoto's engagement with himself and colleagues as characters, as objects of Leighton's gaze, underscores the extent to which sentiment analysis provokes characters and drama, including disaffection rather than simply revealing what's there. So the scene is set. We're characters, not marionettes, in a drama we so poorly call big data. And the question before us is, how might, therefore, an embrace of disaffection, of disaffected authenticity, lead us elsewhere? Even as we realize that disaffection is the point and not resistance even as acting disaffectedly arguably makes us more predictable 
and makes generative algorithms run more smoothly. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, can you hear me all right? Thanks so much, Wendy. That was lovely. And um, really interesting to hear the different sort of approaches to sentiment analysis. It seems like from the title of the talk and um, you know how are you, it seems like there's, there's obviously problems with judging sentiment based on text, the kind of phatic responses that you're talking about. You might say, how are you, but you don't really, um, you're not invested in sentiment in quite the same way. But it seems like the study, the, the studies that you've been quoting uh, are approaching the ideas of, of sentiment and sentiment almost gaming using productivity as data. Um, so the question I sort of wanted to put was, um, what do you think is a reliable means of gauging sentiment in that case? Uh, if it is uh, in a textual sense or a Twitter sense, what are the verbal features you think would be reliable for gauging sentiment? Thank you. Thank you. Um, I think that for me, I want to push a, a little bit against the notion that there are reliable features for measuring sentiment, because what I find fascinating about sentiment analysis is that it doesn't just simply measure, it shapes. So for me, the question is always, um, as you measure this, how are you changing what's also happening, and is the change actually the point, because I think that given how sentiment analysis has always failed, um, the point of sentiment is analysis, again, is that it works well enough to justify mass surveillance. We need everything, and poorly enough to justify even greater surveillance. Um, so for me, the question of what we would need to reliably gauge sentiment um, is is related to a different question that I have and which really drives a lot of this work, which is to try to understand um, how resistance in the humanities might be, um, and the critiques that folks in the humanities often have of the behaviorist so, behavioral social sciences actually might be what makes the behavioral social sciences work. So in other words, Often when you see a behavioral study, people will say, well, people are actors. They know what they're doing. Things are far more complicated. Um, and this undermines what is found, right? But if you take seriously that the, what made the difference was knowing that you had an audience, so these people were, were far more complicated. There was something hidden, et cetera, et cetera. The very act of observing caused this sort of uh, relationship. Um, and because they knew the script, they acted in such a way so that the, both uh, their needs and the management needs could be affected, then the fact that this was a performance or behavior is fundamentally performative seems not to be um, the thing that actually calls into question the behavioral sciences, because we can say the behavioral sciences take everything flat and presume this is sentiment, but it's not. But if it works, then then what does it mean? And so that's the thing that I've been trying to understand. And what's fascinating to me about this history of, of the social sciences, the applied social sciences, is it goes against the normal history of the social sciences at this period, which is that the social sciences um, became inflected with cybernetics um, and moved away from politics, et cetera, et cetera, and moved towards the age of the system. So Hunter Hague's brilliant book about the age of the system. And he says at this point um, in time, any sort of work that was looking at culture and politics fell off the radar. Um, and it did. But then it came back with social media. It came back with you know, the, the moment of, of recommendation systems. right? So for me, this is just a fascinating history of what disappears and comes back around this really gnarly question of what is reliable and what is sentiment. Like it, That's the question that drives all this. And so my point isn't to do better sentiment analysis, although I wonder what this other Wendy Chun is finding. <laughs> um, but rather to really say, OK, this is a really interesting and important question. And let's take sentiment analysis as it's developed here, put it in conversation with affect theory and with the move away from affect theory in the humanities. Let's um, put it together with what's emerging with large language models and the findings that, that they're provoking. And then just fundamentally rework what we think we're doing. 
So we're not doing sentiment analysis, but we're using something like the concept of sentiment to bring us together to do something other. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Wendy. That was a really wonderful talk with um, remarkable research be behind it. Um, I want to ask a question that sort of extends in a different direction than the one that Henry uh, just asked. So I've, I've had some students who are interested, and I know that uh, there are people, for example, in the digital humanities at large who are interested in the use of sentiment analysis for historical corpora. Now, in this case, the people are dead. Um, so we uh, have to take in a different direction the argument that we are shaping or projecting what is happening there. But the fundamental issue is uh, how we can calibrate and interpret sentiment across historical ages. It's not at all clear that the, the words that we recognize as having sentiment values or even polarities right now map easily over what is happening 100 years ago, 200 years ago. The particular instance I have in mind is an undergraduate student who is fascinated with the problem of stoicism over the ages. Now, we have translation problems there, but if we set those aside, we still have the problem of what Stoicism acts and feels and talks like over the centuries. So I just wonder whether you have any thoughts about the, the usefulness or uh, validity of sentiment analysis for historical problems of the kind that many humanities scholars are interested in. Yeah. No, that's a, a, a great question and, and great follow-up. Um, I think that that's... Uh, for me, it's always a question of how we use these models and what for, um, because I do think in many ways these and other what are being used now as predictive models are actually great historical probes. Um, so, in fact, if you were to say, we want to know the difference of how a word has changed or, or sentiment has changed, doing some of these um, models and then mapping them backwards and seeing how they do, do or don't fit actually um, lays out some contours. Um, what's interesting is because language moves so quickly within the field of computer science, they'll do this like comparing um, uh, data sets that are five years apart and show that what's been used and you know, tools that have been trained on one data set five years ago aren't working well. Um, but then also trying to figure out what is working, like what, what are the things that work well across those times. And I think what's so fascinating about using um, sentiment analysis historically, and this is what I want to do with the um, incredible tome of data from the Western Electric um, plant, is to see what emerges when you do that to that very data, right? So they interviewed 20,000 people. Um, they broke down words into a positive, negative. There's this incredible corpus, um, which I think is in the archive, which I, I have to see if I can access. Um, but they said, you know, this is too much information, sentiment analysis, working at positive and negative doesn't get everything. Um, they also did uh, long interviews with people in which uh, they brought together both psychoanalysis and um, different forms of reading based on what emerged from a scan. Um, so I do think that these tools can be used, especially as historical probes. But my question is always, um, what do we want to see from them? Um, because I don't think we're going to get necessarily the, or if we do, again, I think it's because sentiment is far more complicated than um, internal reflexes. Um, so for me, doing something like that would get to the kinds of scripts and dramas and narratives um, that were so key to being in public and engaging um, at that time period. So I would use it less to say, okay, these people were really positive or negative, but rather um, from doing sentiment analysis, how can we understand the various narratives that were shaped and thought through? Um, I don't know, and part of this, I don't know if you know Wendy Lee's really brilliant book. It's a rethinking of the novel. Um, and sort of moving away from Bartleby as the figure um, and arguing actually it was the figure of the prude um, and the figure of the seemingly um, withholding character that drove the novel, that the more withholding the character appeared, uh, the more probing the narrative became, 
Um, and so for me, and, and trying to think through sentiment, is really trying to understand that dance of probe um, and narrative. Thank you for a great talk, Wendy. Really evocative. Um, I appreciated how you know you you drew on these past case studies and talked about um, how sentiment analysis emerges from these labor and carceral contexts. What I wanted to do is kind of take a step back and think about the paradigms that are being mobilized at more of a macro level and. I'm wondering if you see sentiment analysis as a response to psychoanalysis and if it anticipates cognitive neuroscience. So we have, um, you know, with psychoanalysis, the symptom, with behavioral research, the sentiment, and with cognitive neuroscience, the scan. And so there's a move away from, like, the complexity of the subject to a progression toward reduction and an assumption about legibility, especially as we see the reading of brain scans in, in neuroscience and the inferences that are drawn just from seeing flickering colors and movement in, in an image. So I just wonder if you could situate this brilliant analysis maybe a little bit in a broader context of the paradigms that are kind of on parallel tracks and being operationalized in different ways by the tech industries. Yeah, no, that's a great question. And if you go to the um, the Western Electric uh, study, they talk about psychoanalysis. Um, and the whole language of latent and manifest, which are now part of the ways in which we consider you know, vector space comes from psychoanalysis. Um, so Merton, you know, says, you know, I'm taking these terms from Freud, um, but it's a very different understanding of what psychoanalysis is. Um, and so when they do this sentiment analysis and they say, okay, well, well this doesn't get to everything we do these interviews, um, those are pretty much psychoanalytic. It's all about the authority figure, or the father figure, or trying to understand X, Y, and Z. And so it's really interesting because when it emerges at this point, it's both in dialogue with psychoanalysis, but also moving away from psychoanalysis. Because the question here is what can be done at scale, and it's about work or productivity. Um, and so, but it adopts, what it adopts fundamentally is this coupling. Um, and then in terms of cognitive neuroscience, um, that I've looked into less um, because, again, what I find really fascinating is that this work sort of disappears off the disciplinary history charts. Um, and then, like, so in Hake's works and others, this suddenly becomes this other thing um, than cognitive neuroscience, which will be more system-based. Um, but it's fascinating to see how they are reactions uh, both with and against. And Merton at times will say, we don't have uh, the rigor of psychoanalysis. Um, but we're using this in terms of our own sociological um, studies. Um, but the ways they diverge and converge and lose each other, then find each other all the time, for me, is fascinating. It's like, you have latent and manifest, and they're like, this is just like psychoanalysis. Well, no, yeah. It is, because it was right there. Um, but that's, a, that's, a, that's a, a, a wonderful way to think through this, the way it structures um, the history of the behavioral sciences. Oh, I also just realized something, Ellen, in response to you of how we are using sentiment analysis is to understand how large language models operate, um, because well, sentiment analysis models are understandable in a way large language models aren't. Um, but uh, sentiment analysis is basically a subtask of large language models. So what we're doing is studying sentiment analysis in vector space as well as um, various models of both lexicon-based as well as word-to-vec based, et cetera. This is work that Evan Donahue is doing, who's absolutely brilliant. Um, and then trying to understand uh, based on what we can understand, why it maps so well onto large, ma large language models, right? So it's a way in to get to some of the complexities of these. So again, my thing is always to engage with these tools intensely, 
Um, because sometimes I find students also just apply sentiment analysis, so they use Vader, or they use Stanford Core NLP, they, use, they just apply this without thinking through, okay, what is this based on? Um, what is it using? Why, why are the um, errors it produces so interesting, and are they really errors? 